I'm Angela Brady, the President of the RIBA, the Royal Institute of British Architects. Well, I've always wanted to be an architect ever since I was a small girl. Good design is very important. One of the key things that I want to do is I want to be outward looking. I want to bring architecture to the public and I want to bring a good understanding of the value of architecture. And that is in everything we do, where we work, live, play, our homes, our schools, our homes. I think that women are desperately needed within our profession and I will do my utmost to keep pushing for more women in architecture. President of the Royal Institute of British Architects, RIBA, with more than 44,000 members worldwide, the Dublin-born architect Angela Brady is well known for her active promotion of sustainable architecture and campaigning for more women in architecture. Angela won the 2012 Women of Outstanding Achievement Award for Leadership and Inspiration. She's also a TV personality in Ireland and the UK, taking part in programs broadcast on Ireland's national television and radio broadcaster ITV and Channel 4. Hello and welcome to Talk Vietnam. Have you ever imagined living in a house that's cool in the summer and warm in the winter and at the same time requires no air conditioning? Well, thanks to the idea of green architecture, that zero energy, zero carbon house is no longer a dream. It's our honor today to welcome British architect uh, Angela Brady into our studio today. And she's going to be talking to us a little bit about sustainable architecture and how Vietnam can possibly incorporate sustainable architecture into our own buildings. And Angela Brady has been working and living in London for 25 years. She's the president of the Brit of UK's Royal Institute of British Architects and also an active promoter of 2012 London Olympics architecture. Hi, thank you so much for coming. I know Hi. it's been a hectic schedule for you here in Hanoi. And so the first question I want to talk about is actually something that's been going on a lot for right now. It's your new video, the eight minute video. Oh yes. About designing for champions, that's what it's called. And it's for the first time that you've managed, you know, to showcase the architectures, the architects that are involved in the London Olympics architecture. So, so what do you think are some of the snapshots, the highlights of London's, you know, architecture, uh, sustainable well, architecture? Yeah. Um, at the, at the very heart of the Olympic Games, you know, right, you know, from the moment that they were won, going back seven years, you get seven years to prepare. Mm -hmm. um, I sat on the London Development Agency board, and one of the things that we were all pushing for was the sustainable design, um, that the Olympics was just one part of the regeneration of this East End of London, mm -hmm. and that the legacy, so that after the Games are over, that's when the, the whole project of this huge area of London would really continue to transform for the community for the long term. Mm -hmm. So that, that was so important. I think if I was to look at the Olympic Park, um, the velodrome, mm -hmm. which is the cycling ring by Hopkins Architects, mm -hmm. that is one of the most sustainable buildings that we have today, certainly in the sporting field. A naturally ventilated building. It is it's got high quality materials, natural materials. Its cable structure roof uses the minimum amount of steel. If you compare that, for example, to the Beijing bird's nest, it is, it is less than 10% of the steel mm -hmm. for a similar type of structure. Um, the, um, the timber and the ventilation on the timber, is, it looks beautiful. And I think that the very tight way that they have wrapped this building around the function Mm -hmm. and around the audience and that you can also use this building for entertainment events as well. I think that the flexibility that's been built into that is sustainable. The, the water system is sustainable. The way it's cooled with its underground system of cooling and then using the natural stack event mm -hmm. is unique and it's world class. I see. If we were looking at other buildings at the Olympics, you have the basketball arena mm -hmm. which is completely demountable. The, the seating, for example, it's all temporary I see. and goes back to where it was rented from to wow. be reused in other venues. But that whole Olympic um, structure by Wilkinson Air Architects, who are again leading world-class architects. Um, but there are lots of structures in the Olympics that were only built for a short time. The acoustic stage, which I show in my film, mm -hmm. in, comes in three sizes. It can be put up in two or three days and taken down in two or three days and transported anywhere. 
It is a state-of-the-art acoustic design where you do not need amplification. So because of the way it's designed, like, wow. a, like a big pebble. So you don't need any electricity no, at all? Uh, no amplification. Wow. They use it for lighting and for effect, okay. and occasionally for some amplification. But you do not need like another stage, open, open stage. This has been acoustically designed using Arab engineering mm -hmm. acoustics. So um, top quality. Mm -hmm. And what I love about the Olympics is that the whole landscaping has been sustainable in its design in the choice of plants and trees, in the landscaping, in the way it's drained, in the way it links into the water system. Mm -hmm. The whole thing, from the early design stage to the future, 50 to 100 years beyond, is the most sustainable Olympic design to date. Mm -hmm. And that is a great achievement for all of our UK designers. Mm -hmm. The London Olympic 2012 Games was a wonderful opportunity for architects and engineers and designers to showcase their skills on a world stage. Here we present a handful of these projects which demonstrate innovation and design skills, leading a legacy that will be years to come. We wanted the fastest velodrome in the world, the best atmosphere, the best acoustics, and so we looked very closely at all the factors that would influence performance. You can put them up, you can take them down, you can move them, you can put them somewhere else. I think there's a real future for temporary buildings, um, particularly for the Olympics. The whole idea of the structure was to create an indoor acoustic for outdoor performances. And it's got a really beautiful, clear sound, but also a warm sound because it reverberates within the shell before it comes out. It takes about three days to build, uh, about a day to take down, and it, it packs down into a, in about two trucks. Do you have any suggestions? for Vietnam. You know, Vietnam's going to host the 2019 Asian yeah. Games. I think that the model that we had in London, where you plan for the long term, not just for the games themselves, mm -hmm. I think that's number one key. So long term planning. Yeah. I think that to get the very best design, so that these, uh, these buildings, whether they be temporary, that will be taken down and transferred somewhere else, mm -hmm. or the permanent buildings, I'm sure there'll be one or two permanent buildings, that they're actually suitable for now, the future, and way into the future, 50 to 100 years time. Mm -hmm. And that's all about how you have an integrated design plan. Mm -hmm. So that the infrastructure, the energy systems, the uh, roadways, the links from rail or bus exactly. or public transport, or for, public tra or for cars as well, I suppose, mm -hmm. um, that, that that's all worked out in advance. What a great opportunity for 2019 for you, it really is. I see. Now that you've come to Vietnam, you know, the landscape of Vietnam is definitely very, very different from the ones in Europe or the ones of in course. England. So are there some of the things in Vietnam that struck out to you, you know, the way the landscape works or the way the buildings look, the way the um, city is organized? I would like to see Hanoi, for example, much greener. I think you need more trees in the city mm -hmm. because trees absorb carbon. Mm -hmm. They give off oxygen, they absorb the dirt in some ways that you get from fumes of cars, mm -hmm. and they also have what's called the urban cooling effect. Mm -hmm. And that is that with trees and with the shading of trees, it's a much more pleasant environment. Exactly. And it, six degrees cooler, six degrees centigrade cooler with urban with shading trees. with trees. Trees, they're very relaxing mm -hmm. and they're things of beauty. Exactly. And I think that certainly in Vietnam, people love trees. Mm -hmm. so we all love trees. So apart from trees, do you think materials, in terms of you know, the building's materials, have something to do with making you know, the city more sustainable? Yeah, I think very definitely your choice of materials all adds to your carbon footprint. In other words, whether it's going to be affecting our atmosphere, Exactly. Um, or the choice of materials and how it might be transported to Hanoi or whether you use local materials. Mm -hmm. So I know that you've got local materials here and it's great to see those being used. Mm -hmm. And I think that we need more research mm -hmm. and new ways of building and new ways of living mm -hmm. because very often cities develop very quickly and very often the same old um, type of house or type of structure might be used 
and we move quite quickly with technology and yes. we need to change our buildings mm -hmm. as we change mm -hmm. so maybe in the future you might be looking at um, that one step at a time alternative ways of living so that maybe three generations can live quite comfortably in a more um, holistic way with the way you might design your buildings mm -hmm. so not just the narrow model it might be a more spread out model or more I always think that when you look to your history and culture, the answer is there. That's very interesting. And you bring that forward mm -hmm. because that's the way you have developed as a nation, as a city. I see. And then to look back and say, hey, that worked really well. Why aren't we doing more of that, that type of architecture but using contemporary technology? Mm. So naturally ventilated buildings, certainly when I was in Ho Chi Minh City. Exactly. And with a, I went on the whole river walk. When and you were in Ho Chi Minh City last year, 2012? This time last year, yes, for the first sustainability conference. Mm -hmm. um, Ho Chi Minh City with the big wide river. It was amazing. Mm -hmm. And I loved the indigenous housing on stilts. A very sustainable way of living. Mm -hmm. And very happy people. <laughs> and it, it was just, it was something very new for me to see. And I think that was um, an amazing, almost tourist attraction that you can see a whole variety of different ways of living mm -hmm. and that was really amazing and the the boats the different type of boats and the color and the friendly boat and um, so it was a real eye-opener to see something so different mm -hmm. Angela Brady came to Hanoi this time to attend the 2013 sustainable built environment international conference right here in Hanoi where she talked about sustainability challenges in design let's check it out how to mitigate the impacts of the construction industry on the environment, what to do to manage waste and recycle energy and move towards sustainable construction. These questions were discussed during the three-day international conference. Participants said the event was useful for Vietnamese construction industry and the country's strategy to mitigate the impact of climate change. <laughs> À, với uh, các đối tác của chính phủ Anh thì cũng đã chúng tôi cũng đã chia sẻ cái định hướng này và uh, xác định là sẽ cùng nhau để tìm ra các hợp tác nó thiết thực nó hiệu quả để cùng mục tiêu là xây dựng cái cái môi trường xây dựng bền vững mà nước Anh Vương quốc Anh là một trong những nước phát triển rất có kinh nghiệm trong cái lĩnh vực này. President of the UK's Royal Institute of British Architects, Angela Brady, was one among the keynote speakers at the conference this time. She helped bring to the event many internationally recognized architects and experts. Angela also shared her ideas on how to achieve sustainable architecture by knowledge sharing and promoting integrated design strategies. We signed a memorandum of understanding with the School of Architecture in Ho Chi Minh City. This is a great step forward. It means we're going to link together on many ways of research, joint practice, maybe look at a pilot project. And I think that this, this way of sharing knowledge, both professionally and with education and with practice, is a really good way forward. And I think it will help you understand sustainability from our point of view, and we can learn from you too. Though there is no doubt that sustainable architecture is important for future construction, Vietnam needs a different approach since each country faces different challenges, said Richard Hawkins, an architect who has worked in Vietnam, Hong Kong and China for years. The climatic uh, challenges are different to the UK. In the UK it's all about warmth and, and keeping warm. Um, in this region it's more about keeping cool and keeping air flows. So um, I think our experience worldwide is actually very relevant to, to Vietnam. The term sustainable architecture has yet to be familiar globally. Therefore, experts suggest that developing countries like Vietnam study carefully architecture into the So now that you've seen a little bit of Vietnam, what do you think Vietnam can begin, you know, start building on? Is there things that you've seen that may, may work? I haven't seen enough of Vietnam mm -hmm. because I only come for three or four days at a time. That's true. I would love to come for one month mm -hmm. and really get to know a part of the city. Mm -hmm. But based on my experience of traveling in various places around the world, 
I think it's important to look on your own city. Yeah. What are the good points? And map those down. Mm -hmm. And get layers and layers of maps and show the historic area. Mm -hmm. And what's good about that? And preserve it. Wow. Because I think that what makes a special city is its identity. Because they need high levels of energy, high levels of air conditioning, there's too much glass in them, and they're not built with the nature of the surrounding area. Mm -hmm. And although a lot of people say, oh, well, we want to have something like the West, something like the Americans, or something like the European, you can do your own. You can do Vietnamese style, mm -hmm. suitable for the type of climate you have here, that has your style. Exactly. Yeah, and I think that is the way forward. And I think that when I went downtown to the old quarter today, it was amazing. It was really amazing. Okay, too many cars and bikes <laughs> and great hustle and bustle. But it has its own unique identity. And I would love to see some of those streets with no traffic, mm -hmm. only, walking only walking and on a bicycle. Wow. That's what I would like to see. Mm -hmm. And I would like to see that maybe street by street you would have a special interest street and that all of those owners of the street shops and houses and units would get together and they would do it up mm -hmm. as an exem exemplar, as a pilot project. And they'd say, okay, this is street number one, one step at a time, and we're going to bring this back to its original beauty. Mm -hmm. And it might mean taking down a lot of the signage, <laughs> and it might mean opening it up a bit more and painting it up a bit, but it might be just a way of saying, okay, Let's try an experiment. And if it works, it works. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think that there needs to be a step-by-step -step change in the transport system in Hanoi. Mm -hmm. And I think that is possible. Mm -hmm. I think that a move more towards electric, and an electric type car, or the pedal, the pedal bicycle, which has, a, has an electric motor attached when you need it. Exactly. But it's generally a much greener transport. But a public transport system, and I know it's already started because I could see the very good work already started, mm -hmm. a public transport system where people can rely on getting from A to B easily without having to get out their bike or whatever, mm -hmm. their motorbike. So can you cite some examples of you know, a successful green urban city in the world today? Well, I think, uh, although we have some in the UK, mm -hmm. I want to, uh, to suggest some other places like Copenhagen, mm -hmm. Amsterdam. Uh -huh. These are two cities that I know very well. I lived in Copenhagen for a year and a half, many years ago when I was a student. Mm -hmm. And the transportation system there was far ahead of anywhere else in the world. Wow. Bicycle, buses and trains on time. Mm -hmm. Easy to get around the city. Well, we're talking about a much smaller city, you know, a couple of million. Um, the same as I'm from Dublin in Ireland. Yes. Liar. small city again mm -hmm. they're working on their transportation system to get it better mm -hmm. um, but I think certainly um, places like Amsterdam where the bicycle and the pedestrian is king over all other transportation that is the way forward mm -hmm. and that's why I love those cities I love the housing that they have in North Europe they have co-housing where many families can live together and you can have a flexible housing arrangement mm -hmm. one bed two bed three bed depending on the needs at that time of your life. So if you have a big family or more family or extended family, and you can be within the same community with common facilities mm -hmm. where you can eat together when you want to, you have your privacy when you want to. So a co-housing model, I think, is a wonderful model. So how is the green urban architecture developing in the UK and Europe and the world as a whole? And can you compare that with the situations in the developing countries? Yeah, I think people much more aware now of green urban architecture. Mm -hmm. I think if you look at even places like Cuba, Cuba grow vegetables in the streets. I haven't been to Cuba wow. now myself, but from my friends that have been there, it's a very sustainable city and it's changing. In Switzerland, many of the streets are turned over to grassland and trees, grassland where they are saying every second street in this area, no cars, wow. bicycles and walking. And it's a change in attitude, which I think people are really embracing. Mm -hmm. And I think because 
50% or 60% of people live in cities now and more and more people in the future are drawn to cities. We've got to make those cities attractive for living in. Mm -hmm. And I think that the streets, the squares, the places for people, mm -hmm. the trees, the, um, the livable environment is what we need to be aiming for. Exactly. Yeah. Now Vietnam is currently throwing up hot with buildings all around big cities and provinces all around the country. So let's check out how the country of Vietnam is responding to the idea of a sustainable built environment. Despite the booming in the construction sector in recent years, not many Vietnamese developers have paid attention to sustainable architecture. Many of the new urban areas currently under development either qualify as meeting housing needs or environmental and social factors, but not both at the same time. However, according to experts, there is potential for the development of sustainable architecture in Vietnam. Về cái quan điểm bền vững thì có thể nói ngay cả trên thế giới thì cũng cũng mới được cập nhật và đây là một cái khái niệm rất mới. Nhưng mà chúng tôi nghĩ là chúng ta có cái cái lợi thế là chúng ta trao đổi và học tập kinh nghiệm của các nước khá là sớm và trong cái giai đoạn đang phát triển như thế này thì chúng ta vẫn còn kịp thời gian để mà À, xử lý các vấn đề của công trình cũng như là của môi trường cũng như là vấn đề về kiến trúc để mà đạt được các cái tiêu chí về bền vững. Despite the environmental benefits bring, sustainable architect requires large initial investment. Best point of view are not I would like to encourage so, the building up of their own wastewater treatment facility, wherein most probably the wastewater can be recycled so that you can make use of that for watering the plants. So it would also be nice in their environmental impact study before they submit that to the government of Vietnam, there should always be another chapter aside from wastewater about that solid waste management program in every community. While the global construction sector consumes an average 24% of the total energy for residential housing, the figure is doubled in Vietnam, standing at 54%. Vietnam also has yet to handle the technology to produce environmentally friendly building materials, and that's why the CO2 emissions are high. Experts urge Vietnamese architects to find their own approaches to sustainable architecture. Don't copy us because we have made some mistakes. Design your communities for how you live and for your people, and your people will move there and enjoy their life. Don't copy us because we're not perfect, and we use a lot of energy, and we're expensive. A lack of legislation and criteria are the main reasons why Vietnamese developers pay little attention to sustainable architecture. This is compounded by wrong assessments on the costs and benefits of green designs, which leading to little investment in the sector. While efforts have been made to raise awareness of sustainable architecture, only a small fraction of sustainable designs have been implemented in reality. Vietnam itself is experiencing very, very hot growth in construction. You know, we're cutting down a lot of trees, we're building up a lot of new buildings, and that has done a big toll on the environment. So in your opinion, how can Vietnam move towards a sustainable built environment, but at the same time still be climate friendly and nature friendly? I think for every tree you cut down, mm -hmm. you plant two new ones. Oh. So you have a policy in place, asked for by the people, that the government will implement or the government might say what do you think and let's do this so it's a matter of really getting the green belt getting these green lungs in cities mm -hmm. in Ho Chi Minh City for example um, there's the Tang Da area yes. which I believe is a wonderful opportunity to create an oasis of sustainable design mm -hmm. to have a green very lush area for growing, growing vegetables, for planting lots of trees, to have a park for people to go to, so that it's a destination place. Mm -hmm. So tourism, 
is one of the biggest um, financial incentives for any growing city. Exactly. They've got to make the city attractive mm -hmm. and people like to be able to go, you know, Ho Chi Minh City's got a fantastic Tang Da Park. Mm -hmm. It's got animals as well and it's got indigenous architecture and indigenous people mm -hmm. and it shows the history and culture and identity and it's got a pilot project mm -hmm. for sustainable design. That's right. Imagine if you had something like that. I would definitely be on that plane to go and see. Oh, wow, that's awesome. So in terms of looking at the location itself, what was it about the location that, you know, sticks out to you, to you as, okay, this is the place that can possibly hold a pilot project in, sustainable, in sustainability? Well, on the Tang Da one? Yes. In Tang Da, because I went up the river and I could see from a distance the way a lot of tall buildings were being built that didn't look part of the natural habitat I see. and they looked alien. Mm -hmm. Some of the buildings looked quite alien, the glass skyscrapers. And I thought, well maybe maybe this is not the right direction. Mm -hmm. There are other ways of building which are more low rise and maybe four or five, six stories and you can develop areas of new cities that are more people orientated mm -hmm. with the streets and the squares and the shopping and the business and the homes and the flats. Exactly. Um, so there's lots of opportunities. But when I saw Tang Da, it was an unspoilt area. It had a lot of character. And, it's and it was part of the old Silk Route, the old Silk Road. Mm -hmm. So it had so much history attached to it. Exactly. And I think that you've got to preserve some areas. And I think that needs a red line drawn around it. Preserve this area. <laughs> and wouldn't it be wonderful if for the climate for Ho Chi Minh City, mm -hmm. that a pilot project with a university park campus might be in that area, building using indigenous materials mm -hmm. of ways of, of using the old ways with modern technology. Exactly. So I think that's a potential. Mm -hmm. So are there any indigenous materials in Vietnam you might have seen that may work? Well, I know that you have bamboo, for example. Bamboo, bamboo is an underused material, I believe. Exactly. There, that is a very sustainable material. Mm -hmm. It's a very good building product. It breathes easily. It doesn't move or expand too much. So I think more experimentation with bamboo. I see. With anything that you can grow, and you have a wonderful climate for growing quite quickly exactly. because of the temperate climate. Um, it's just uh, everything seems to grow so well. So I think, I think growing things is a very good way of doing things. Mm -hmm. Using water, you can harness the energy from water. Water. We have a lot of water. You have a lot of water. And recycling water. Mm -hmm. And um, you, we use brown water, green water, grey water. Um, oh. There's a lot of different ways. Mm -hmm. So I think we can learn from each other. We can share knowledge. We can do research together. Mm -hmm. And I think that really um, bringing new ideas and new ways through pilot projects mm -hmm. and having that integrated design model where you're, you're planning long term, always planning exactly. long term. Mm -hmm. So do you think there's an opportunity for Vietnamese and British architects to possibly collaborate in terms of research? Absolutely there is. And um, today I will be signing an MOU, a mm -hmm. Memorandum of Understanding, with the Hanoi School of Architecture. Oh wow, that's great. And um, a few weeks ago, following my visit last year in Ho Chi Minh City, the group from the School of Architecture in Ho Chi Minh City were in my office in the RIBA in London, and I signed an MOU, Memorandum of Understanding, of how we can work together with the universities, with the schools of architecture, with the people in practice, so we can share knowledge, particularly on how to do sustainable design. Can you share any lessons contain, containing national policies? Now we're going to go to the national policies yeah. part about, of the UK or Europe or other countries that you know that might work um, to build a sustainable built environment right here in Vietnam. Yeah, well, the London um, mayor, Boris Johnson, is in. They are particularly um, pushing high sustainable building, the best ideas and the best designs. Mm -hmm. They're using public transport as a number one key to cut down major traffic. They've got a bike scheme where you can pick up and hire a bike. Mm -hmm. They've got a car hire scheme. Wow. So you can just use a credit card 
and pay by the five pounds an hour to use a car if you need to. Wow. They've got a congestion zone um, penalty. So if you want to bring a car into the five mile limit of the city centre, or is it, I think it's five, maybe it's less than five miles, but um, maybe it's five kilometres. Five kilometres. If you want to go into the city centre, you have to pay eight pounds. That's a lot of money. Even if you go in for two minutes, if you go past that zone in a car, you have to pay. Wow. So it keeps cars out. Exactly. It makes people use public transport. And now there are safer cycle routes. Mm -hmm. So there's a huge cycling boom in, in, in London right now. Mm -hmm. There's different cities in England, I'm pretty sure, you know, has different potentials in developing green. So among the cities that you've seen in Vietnam, which city do you think has the most potential to becoming a green city? I think all cities have got potential. You've got to have the, the political willpower. You've got to have the people that want to have a more sustainable lifestyle. So with those two together, um, it is worth investing in green architecture. It only costs about 6% more, mm -hmm. which is very little. Wow, that's very little. Because you make the savings over the years. And it's the way you design. Mm -hmm. It's the way you orientate your building towards the sun or towards the north or south, if mm -hmm. you want shading or if you want to get sun, mm -hmm. if you want to use solar panels or whatever way you want to use your water systems within the dwellings themselves. All about reducing, recycling, reusing. Exactly. You're also known as a television personality. How has TV helped you promote modern architecture and women in architecture? I think it's wonderful to use the media because I believe that people should know more about green design and what they can do personally. Mm -hmm. oh, wow, so for example, on Twitter, every week I put up um, 52 ways to go green. Mm -hmm. So 52 weeks in the year, 52 weeks to go green, it's, it's a hashtag eco dash check dash pack I think I'll follow your Twitter after yeah. today <laughs> so um, so every week I put up simple ways because we don't understand energy and how energy is you know costed yes. kilowatt hours kilowatt hour, whether it be gas or electricity mm -hmm. so I think that we need more smart metering in our homes with a big dashboard in our homes of your energy use and if everybody is aware of their energy use they will cut it down I see. and you'll see oh there's lights on upstairs but nobody's up there mm -hmm. turn them off exactly and it's just we're using so much water water is measured in cubic meters we use about 2.3 cubic Three meters a week mm -hmm. that's a hell of a lot of water but if we have gray water systems it means that the water is used better and that all the water that is purified as drinking water mm -hmm. doesn't get flushed down the toilet. Exactly. That you have drinking water, mm -hmm. you have grey water, and you have water for the garden and for plants, mm -hmm. and that you collect water. So there's lots of different ways that we can be sustainable. Mm -hmm. Our food choices is one third of our carbon footprint, mm -hmm. and we also throw away an awful lot of food in Europe by bad management of supermarkets, mm -hmm. by bad management of the way we cook and mm -hmm. throw away food that we don't eat. Mm -hmm. So once we're aware of how we can be more sustainable, we can save energy, we can save food, we can buy less, we can consume less, and we can live a better lifestyle. I see. So my little week to week is a grassroots level up of how you can make your house greener. Mm -hmm. Little tips on how to cut out drafts in winter uh -huh. to more insulation. It gives website information to Energy Savings Trust and they have a website on how to be more green and it links in how to get a grant from the government on the green deal that we have which allows people to um, take money from their energy bills of the future so they pay over a couple of years and they make their houses greener now I 
see. So there's lots of different ways that our government mm -hmm. are getting, empowering people mm -hmm. to make that change themselves. So you're like a connector between, you know, yeah. the and the yeah. people themselves. Our own experience. What is the importance of architectural tourism? I think one of the important things about traveling is that um, people go to places they want to see. Mm -hmm. So if your city is a very beautiful city, City or any of the places in between. You've got such a wonderful long coastline. We do. Yeah. We do. Um, that people will travel because it's different and they want to experience your history and culture and your identity. They don't want to be traveling all the way. What's special about Vietnamese um, craft work? about the way you might do things differently. That's what I would come for. I would come to see what's special and unique about Vietnam, the beautiful buildings. And then I can see those beautiful buildings through history. Exactly. I mean, tourism is huge for people to see the beautiful cities. And I believe, as a nation, our cities reflect the way we think about ourselves, mm -hmm. our people, and our culture. Exactly. And the more that we see of that, the more you will get people appreciating what you do for your own people. Mm -hmm. Are there any other things that helps draw a person to a city, apart from a city's historical, cultural uniqueness? People are drawn to people's friendliness. And mm -hmm. the Vietnamese people, very like the Irish people, are very friendly. Mm -hmm. And I think that people like to have good hospitality. Yes. The Vietnamese have fantastic hospitality. Well, I've always wanted to be an architect ever since I was a small girl. I think that women are desperately needed within our profession, and I will do my utmost to keep pushing for more women in architecture. I go into schools, I run workshops from six-year-olds up to 16-year-olds. And when you go into schools and you say, hey, I'm an architect and I love my job, it's just fantastic for kids to see that, to see role models and say, hey, I could do architecture too. I was asked to chair Women in Architecture at the RIBA and it was a wonderful opportunity to actually have a voice. I showcased Diverse City exhibition and it went to 34 cities around the world promoting what we do as women architects and engineers. We've got a returners course and we have a mentoring program. To win this award for me personally, honor. I have admired WISE for many years and I think to have some thanks for all the hard work that you've done with your colleagues. We don't work alone in this. It is really a real honour. So as such a big advocate for women, you've won the Women of Outstanding Achievement Award for Leadership and Inspiration in 2012. So what were your feelings when you received that award? Well, I was very happy to receive it. I was delighted because um, it's really nice to, to get an award for something that you have a passion for and you spend so much time, you know, inspiring other people. Yes. And I work together with many women, so it is not just for me. That award is for the many people that I work with. Mm -hmm. I championed women architects, and I still do, mm -hmm. but I, I was chair of women in architecture at the right. RBA for five years. And during that time, I said, let's not moan in a negative way, oh, there's only 10% at the time, now we have 20% women mm -hmm. in practice, and we have 50% in colleges and university. In the Middle East, they have 80% women architects. Wow. So it wow. varies around the world. So I put together with my colleagues Diverse City, and Diverse City was about the people who are architects and engineers. Exactly. And we brought this Diverse City exhibition to four cities around the world promoting women architects mm -hmm. and designers. And whenever I brought it, I brought it to 16 of these cities. Wow. So to China, to Australia, to New Zealand, um, other colleagues brought it to India, I brought it all around Europe. And everywhere we went, we said, give us 30 or 40 of your best women architects, show us the buildings, mm -hmm. and show us their ethos. Exactly. And, and show us what's important to them about diversity and being a woman designer. So we've got these wonderful comments also on our website, women-in-architecture.com. And it's for city. City with city. Mm -hmm. 
And women are very sustainably minded. They're very community minded. That's true. And we are very good communicators. Mm -hmm. You'll find in television there are a lot of women as well. Mm -hmm. But I think that women and men together make better sustainable architecture. Mm -hmm. We can't just have one voice on this. Addressing your inauguration as the president of RIBA in September 2011, you once said, architects foresee, create and build. We create change. Can you elaborate on this? You've done your research very well. <laughs> I believe that architects have vision. Mm -hmm. We are visual people. What we need to do is share vision with people who are building, whether it be governments, whether it be developers, whether it be private individuals. And because we are trained as designers, we have the knowledge to design sustainable buildings and sustainable communities. And design for people at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. We are not building icons to ourselves and to our egos. Exactly. Although in the past, it many people have been accused of this. <laughs> Sometimes clients want egotistical buildings to themselves or their corporations. Mm -hmm. I believe that time has passed. I believe that the new way forward is creating livable communities for people, where people want to live. People want to come because there are beautiful buildings and streets and squares mm -hmm. that have quality and have identity. And we can help create. So, our last question in your opinion, what are the prerequisites that Hanoi must have to achieve? To become a city, uh, to become a city that you like with the buildings and with, with green, ar sustainable architecture, and how many years may it take us to achieve that? I think you have to go one step at a time in Vietnam towards sustainability. The first step is the political will. Mm -hmm. So your politicians and your rulers need to want to make the city sustainable. The people who live here must want to have a more sustainable and green city. Together, the starting point will be the master plan. How do you work the master plan? To look at the problems you have, mm -hmm. to do some research on how to resolve those problems. Traffic is a huge problem. Exactly. You haven't got gridlock yet. It's not far off. So you've got to sort out your transportation models. You've got to make your city greener physically. And I think a huge tree planting scheme, linear parks, safe cycle routes mm -hmm. to bring back the bicycle, exactly. which a lot of our European cities are doing now, mm -hmm. would be another step. Another step would be how do we make our existing buildings more sustainable without using air conditioning? Mm -hmm. They can be adapted. They can be reused. All new buildings should be set at a code for proper sustainability. So that all new buildings, particularly public buildings, mm -hmm. you, you have the willpower. It is not that much more expensive. It's a small amount more. For set, you said. Yeah, for long-term saving. Exactly. Because we must cut that bill to make our air better. And to have more trees, our air quality will go up. To have less traffic, our air quality. And our health, everybody's health will be better. Exactly. But creating that beautiful city in the way you build based on your own history and your own culture, I look forward to seeing. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for being on the show today. I know it's been very, very hectic for you in Hanoi, but thank you for talking to us about you know, how history can be preserved and how tradition can be used to make buildings more modern and how green buildings must be catered, modern architecture should be catered to the needs of the community. So thank you so much. Thank you. It's been a pleasure here and thank you for asking me. I hope to come back. Thank you. We hope to see you back. Oh, great. <laughs> That's it for this edition of Talk Vietnam. I'm Mai Phu, and thank you for watching the show, and we'll see you next time.